And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. That I'm sure I'm sure you know plenty about like Mark Armitage and his bison horn that is supposedly a, a ceratop or triceratops horn, ceratopsian horn. I've seen the name Ar Armitage, but I don't remember the thing about the, that you're talking about now. Yeah, so he, <laughs> I got I got I actually have a, a a buddy who knows the story way better than I do, but he he supposedly has harnessed right uh, genetic material from this from this triceratops horn, which looks suspicious suspiciously in morphology uh, like a like a bison horn. He won't tell where he found it. Um. He's got one photograph of it with with a scale, you know, the scale included. Um, but then in his actual release, his quote unquote press release, he's saying that it's actually much larger than it is, despite the fact that he's included his own scale. And the genetic material that he's claiming to have found has a half life of like three or four weeks. So this, you know, we got the top brass on this, you know. Well, we were looking at dinosaur fossils. The, the bones have been fossilized from dinosaurs. Um, and these honestly look more like rocks to me, but they're, <laughs> what, what do you have here? What are you well, studying? Well, this actually is not a bone. These are fragments of a triceratops horn. Okay. Uh, in 2012, the Creation Research Society sponsored Mark Armitage and I to go to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, which is a very popular place for finding dinosaur bones, and we instead dug out a Triceratops brow horn. Now, it's just in crumbled pieces now, so we can't really, you know, put it together and show you a horn. And what we've done, of course, is have to work with it where you actually destroy portions of it. But you have to recognize that inside that rock-looking structure are tissue, cells, and protein, still there. All right, so let, let's go back for a second because um, if, if this uh, horn or uh, part of a dinosaur had been buried for millions and millions of years, you would not expect to still be able to see tissue, but are you saying that's what we're finding? That is absolutely what we're finding. In fact, in a Nature Communication paper in 2015, they referred to it as common. Hmm. So is this, uh, is this unusual for those who have followed uh, the traditional paradigm associated with when dinosaurs lived and when they died? It would certainly be not at the least expected. In fact, Mary Schweitzer, who was the first one to really make this popularized, you know, the first one to really get discoveries that were noticed by a wide range of scientists, she comments in interviews that she had her technicians repeat the study over and over and over again simply because it's so difficult to understand how you could have this material still in a dinosaur fossil that is supposed to be 65, 70, 75, 80 million years of age. Because any competent biochemist knows that tissue, cells, proteins break down. They don't just, they're not concrete. They don't just exist for eons of time. They break down. And in fact, they tend to break down fairly quickly depending upon the conditions. And certainly in Hell Creek, the conditions would be warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down. We found this horn, for example, just a mere one foot below the surface. So there was no thermal protection by being deep in the ground. So it would have been very much subjected to fluctuations of hot and cold and hot and cold. And any biochemist can tell you that is the fastest way to destroy material. It's difficult enough to envision it surviving for four or 5,000 years, but 60 million years, 70 million years, see that really becomes very difficult to make any kind of biochemical basis for how it could have survived. Okay, well let's talk now about what you do with these, okay? okay. You've got these here. Uh, what would be your standard process of wanting to then examine? Well, as you can see, these look like a rock. So what you have to do is you have to literally dissolve the rock away. So what we do is we soak the fossil material in a solution called EDTA. 
It's a very mild acid that will grab the calcium ions out of the fossil. And so you just literally dissolve the fossil. And what you'll have after you dissolve the fossil is the tissue will be remaining because the EDTA won't dissolve the tissue. So where are you now in this process? What would be your next well, step? Well, some of these have just started, but the next step would be then we would take, we would take and we'd pour off the solution. Okay. Right now, I'm not, I'm not worried about what's in here. I will collect that and analyze it at some point later, but right okay. now, I'm just wanting to look at this. So it's left there. Right. Okay. So then I'll bring this over to uh, what we call a dissection microscope. Mm -hmm. As you can see, what we see is this is, in essence, dissolved Triceratops horn magnified. Well, Kevin, what did you find then uh, when, you, when you were looking at the sample and you actually found some, some tissue? Okay, here's what we found. Here we have a piece of the horn that has been decalcified, like what I just showed you over on the bench. Mark Armitage was our microscopist working on this. And Mark then took a piece of the decalcified horn and put it under a microscope. See the fibrous material there? That's part of the composition of the bone matrix itself. But what's really of interest is see the white material here on the surface swaying back and forth? That, that's actual dinosaur tissue on the surface. See, this is not a solid fossil. This has got tissue characteristic to it. See, notice how it flexes back. And that's, of course, very interesting, how you pull on it, flexes back, pull on it, flexes back. That's characteristic of tissue. That's what tissue would do. Now, Mark then was able to extract some very thin layers of elastic material away from the inner core of the horn. But he didn't have to decalcify the horn in order to do this. You can see it's stretchy, it's flexible. In fact, look, notice, see how it's stretching? It's stretching almost to twice its original size of what it was. See, this again is original dinosaur tissue that he's peeled directly from the fossil. There was no decalcification that he did first. See, this is how accessible this tissue was. He didn't have to remove any fossilized bone to get to this tissue. Okay, now, here is a light microscope picture of the tissue itself. You can see the texture of it. And in fact, see, notice the arrows, they're pointing to cells. These cells specifically are what we call osteocytes. Those are bone cells. They're involved in making bone because even though we think a bone is a rock, bone is tissue. Bone is not a rock. Mm -hmm. In fact, in our bodies, bone is replaced about every 10 years to keep it all fresh and the new matrix laid down and such. So it, it's constantly being changed and that's what those cells do. And if you look at them then at a closer magnification, well, we see then this is using scanning electron microscopy. You see the extreme detail of the cells. See how well that's preserved. It I is. mean, that doesn't speak for something that has been degrading or something that is just been in a non-pristine condition mm -hmm. for 65, yes. 70 million years. Mm -hmm. We would not expect, begin to expect to see such enormous and elaborate detail. I mean, these structures are incredibly oh. small. You know, this is our 20 micron bar here. See how small these structures are, still intact. And yet, see that kind of detail, then obviously the preservation process is surprising really to everybody. Yeah. But I think as, as creationists, we have a lot less to explain than someone trying to suggest that this is, you know, 65, 70 million years of age. Well, let me ask you this uh, first, because, I mean, this is an incredible picture. Um, and I just want to make sure we're not looking at fossilized uh, material here, no, fossilized tissue. No, this correct. that's been replaced correct. by calcium. These, these are is, the cells. These are real cells. Correct. Well, Kevin, I understand you published all of this work. Yes, Is that right? this work has been published. We've actually made the cover of American Laboratory. Mm. We also published in a journal called ACTA Histochemica, and that's a more technical article. It goes through and explains then what we did, how we processed the horn, and then, of course, draws some conclusions from that. Particularly, the conclusions are that it, even though it's a horn, which is different from a bone, it still had tissue. Even though it was wet when we pulled it out of the ground, it had what we call matrix, which is another word for mud, 
It still had tissue, so just a different specimen than what had been analyzed before. No one had done a horn before. Now we start getting closer, oh. and what you're going to see right. then is you're gonna see little pieces of tissue there, and that's what you're gonna pick off and then put under the higher powered microscope. Okay, and then under the higher powered microscope, see now we look at the tissue itself, and there's the cells. Okay, and then there's another that and like I say those are very specific osteocytes now those osteocytes have a very unique structure Okay, now we're coming into some of the texture of the horn itself and see this would be a blood vessel and if you look you see huh. the, this is this is dissolved away this would be the interior of the horn and you can see all the detail that'd be left in there after you take the calcium away and then there, of course, is an osteocyte. So that has to have shaken up the scientific community. What's been the response of all of this? The initial response, when Dr. Schweitzer first published her work, which is what became very popularized in 2005, it generated a lot of response that previous papers had not generated. And there's kind of a question of exactly why it generated so much response. But in 2005, it was, her paper was published in the journal Science, which is a very broad distributed journal, very highly respected journal. Color pictures, you know, you can't minimize the impact of color pictures. So you had people that would be more biochemistry and biology backgrounds that maybe for the first time paid attention to this. So that generated, I think, some, some not only publicity for it, but certainly some controversy. And so initially, some of the reaction was rejection. Oh, it's contamination. You know, that's, oh, a, that's oh. not really dinosaur. It's microscopic artifact. Mm -hmm. It's bacteria, because bacteria can look kind of strange sometimes. So you had a lot of proposals of what it could be. And to her credit, Dr. Schweitzer did more work, which is what science is. She did more analytical work, dug deeper. They began to find protein. You break open some of these cells. You look in the, at the matrix these cells are attached to, and they're protein. Particularly one of the common proteins they found is called collagen. Now, collagen is the most common protein in any vertebrate. Vertebrate meaning those animals that have spinal columns. Collagen is the most dominant protein. It's a hearty protein, but there was no reason based on any kind of biochemistry known about collagen, any kind of biochemistry of how collagen degrades. There was no reason to think that collagen could naturally easily survive mm -hmm. for 65, 70 million years. And all of that research, did it lead towards the conclusion that it's not bacteria, it's not something that It uh, very much it? did, right. That you can dismiss the bacteria idea, you can dismiss the contamination idea, it is real dinosaur tissue, real dinosaur cells, and real dinosaur protein. Okay, so once that is uh, understood, yes. then what happens? Now this is shaking it up, I guess. That becomes part of the controversy because clearly you're now faced with how could you explain the survival of this, the pristine survival mm. of this, not only for so long, but in very unpristine conditions. There's nothing pristine about Hell Creek, Montana, for example. It, it's not permafrost. It's not like these were in a deep freeze for millions of years. Like we mentioned before, the temperature fluctuations, water, you know, what water will degrade proteins. When we pulled the horn out of the ground, it had water underneath it just from the seepage of rainwater. That's why when we first dug the horn out, we thought, oh, there's nothing gonna be in there. And there was. So these are not dry, they're not sealed in some kind of you know, stainless steel vault. They're subjected to all kinds of conditions that would degrade this oh. stuff. And so then the controversy has been, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. And if you read some of the literature, there's almost like desperation of, would you guys please explain this? Because they recognized what the implications of this could be. Now, some people would claim, well, it means nothing because we know how old they are and therefore it just means it survived somehow, big deal. But how do you know how old they are? Well, you used methods, supposed methods of dating. Well, this is a method of dating. 
the tissue itself can't be discounted as part of a method of dating. So why do you say that doesn't count, but this does count? Well, it's all the paradigm drives your conclusions. The paradigm is it has to be old. Therefore, methods that give us an old fossil are what we choose. Something that doesn't give us an old fossil like tissue, we have to reject or explain away. Mm -hmm. And the big push at the moment is to explain it away, to come up with some explanation of how the tissue survived. There are several ideas out there. The most popular one at the moment is the one that Mary Schweitzer herself has proposed, where she proposed that in red blood cells, you have hemoglobin, which of course is composed of iron, which is what then attracts and binds the oxygen so that the hemoglobin in the red blood cell can transport the oxygen around in the body. Okay, what she's proposed is that upon the death of the animal, the red blood cells ruptured and they released the hemoglobin, which released the iron. In biological systems, iron can catalyze what's called a Fenton reaction. And this reaction, in essence, just causes proteins, for example, to cross-link. So it causes reactions of the proteins so that they actually become more resistant. So in this cross-link state, microbes don't degrade them as fast, enzymes don't degrade them as fast, they just simply don't compose as fast. And so she's proposed that that then explains how they could last millions of years. We reject what she's at least proposed so far because we would say first off Fenton reactions are also going to leave signatures they're going to leave signatures and how they're going to change the chemical state of certain amino acids and in the protein analysis has been done of like the collagen for example those amino acids in that protein don't have that altered chemical state that you would expect from a Fenton reaction. See, so we're not seeing the footprints that we would expect to see if these reactions were actually causing these massive changes to the proteins that were causing them to be preserved better. We would also say that the models themselves that have been studied take some of this into account. You know, the collagen models, they take into account some of the physical changes that are gonna to occur to collagen that you would say may make it more resistant to degradation. And yet the studies show that it still doesn't last tens of millions of years. So there is no physical chemical evidence that's going to support the idea that proteins, any protein, is gonna be able to last tens of millions of years. It's just strictly an extrapolation. It must last because we know these are old. And there becomes your conundrum. Again, the paradigm driving the conclusion. We also would challenge that the study that Dr. Schweitzer did, she used ostrich blood vessels and she soaked them in water, soaked them in solutions of of, of iron from hemoglobin, soaked them in various solutions, and then monitored their degradation, how fast they degrade. And she reported that after two years, those that were exposed to, her, to the iron were, for the most part, undegraded. But first, two years at a steady temperature doesn't extrapolate to 65 million years at an unsteady temperature. Second, any technician can tell you that we take great pains in laboratories to preserve cells, to preserve protein, to preserve tissue. We freeze it. We deep freeze it. We freeze it, you know, minus 200 degrees in liquid nitrogen. You don't leave it out. You don't expose it to water. You don't expose it to all the things that, in all honesty, these fossils tended to be exposed to because everybody knows that accelerates degradation. So in, in the normal sense, uh, even uh, someone who holds to a very uh, recent creation, uh, that would lead you to believe that this shouldn't be here either, right? Because even for uh, several thousands of years, you wouldn't expect that. It certainly would not be your first prediction. Even from a creationist position, we know full well that these fossils are exposed to ground level radiation. In fact, you could take almost any dinosaur fossil and put a Geiger counter against it and it'll light it up because huh. they've absorbed radiation. So even for 4,000 years, we say, wow, that's still quite a challenge to think they'd absorb radiation and still, so how are you gonna explain 65 million years of exposure to this radiation? And 
Dr. Schweitzer's iron preservation model doesn't account for that. So as a microbiologist, uh, when you look at this, uh, the two major paradigms that we have before us, and uh, even though this is surprising, there is a paradigm uh, between these right, two right. that better fits the evidence Absolutely. than the other. I think we understand enough about the process and enough about tissue itself to recognize that the more clear, parsimonious, if you will, the, 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 the simplest explanation is simply that the fossils aren't as old as they're being claimed to be. And so that clearly, this is in violation of the dating process. It challenges the entire dating process. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, which I would say this is clear evidence they have, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism have been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic ages themselves are incorrect. And we have to go back and recognize that they use evolution as their control, if you will. It's the filter. If I don't get a date that fits what evolution expects, then the date is rejected. It doesn't make a difference what the date is. It doesn't make a difference how you came about getting the date if it doesn't fit the filter of evolution, if it doesn't fit what we need. If you have something that's out of the Jurassic, but it's dated at 300 million years, that can't be right. Therefore, it's automatically tossed out. Why can't it be right? Because we have, in evolutionary assumptions, determined that organisms that lived during the period of the Jurassic are this old. Hmm. And so it sets then the interpretation for everything. Hmm. When you have problems like the soft tissue, see, you either have to re reject the entire dating process or you have to reject the soft tissue. You know, you really can't have both. They're trying to have both, but it clearly is one or the other. You know, either the fossils aren't as old as we think they are, or there's some mysterious, unknown, magical process that preserves them. Well, which is more scientific? What we know today, the tissue can't last that long, therefore the fossils can't be that old, regardless of what other dating methods you claim you've used. Ooh, the new rave in evolutionism is that birds are just dinosaurs and that dinosaurs evolved into birds. There is a joke that KFC should change its name to KFD, Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. But not all of evolutionary scientists accept this nonsense. A proponent is one renowned ornithologist, Alan Fiducci of the University of North Carolina. He recently stated, the theory that birds are the equivalent of living dinosaurs and that dinosaurs were feathered is full of holes, so much so that creationists have jumped all over it. He further laments, with the advent of feathered dinosaurs, we are truly witnessing the beginning of the meltdown of the field of paleontology. Those looking for evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs will be disappointed because the creator told us that he created birds before land animals, such as dinosaurs. In the early 90s, researchers from Montana State University made an amazing discovery. Inspecting a piece of T-Rex bone under a microscope, they could hardly believe their eyes. They could see dinosaur red blood cells. This discovery prompted lead scientist Mary Schweitzer to say, It is exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone but of course, I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? In the A Discover Magazine article, Dr. Schweitzer explained further her response. If you take blood cell samples and you stick them on the shelf, you have nothing recognizable in about a week. Why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? Well, the only reason there would be anything left in dinosaurs comes down to there being iron in the blood. However, this excuse falls short, as you are about to see. But first, let's touch on two other reasons that this cannot happen. As I am explaining these two other major problems with why dinosaur bones cannot be 65 million years old, look at all the findings of soft tissue discovered recently and how they know to look for it now, rather than just assume it doesn't exist at all. Problem number one, the mostly left-handed amino acids that should be equally right-handed and left-handed if they were Jurassic. They are not there. The laws of chemistry demonstrate that after death, amino acids go back to a 50-50 mixture of right and left-handed amino acids. The England's Royal Society published a time range for when this physical process to occur, which produces totally racemized amino acids in 100,000 to 1 million years maximum. So, obviously, that is not even close to 65 million years old. Another problem, 
the amino acid methionine is very susceptible to strong oxidizing agents like hydrosol, which would quickly oxidize methionine into methionine sulfoxide. The Nature Communication study results revealed unoxidized methionine in some of the Alberta dinosaur specimens. Also consider this, the research on the Egyptian mummies has established a 10,000 year upper limit for how long biological molecules can survive. Now, back to iron for just a moment. If you want to see the rescuing device for iron preservation fail in real time, it's easy. Just look for yourself. One of the most striking examples of soft tissue preservation in dinosaur fossils, if you look at the photos in the paper, you see no evidence of iron particles. The only place she saw iron was inside partially degraded tissue. You see, iron in blood, which gets released at death, cannot preserve all soft tissue decay for millions of years because it still degrades collagen proteins, which have also been found in some specimens. So while iron might preserve some soft tissue, it obviously is not responsible for all soft tissue preservation. Also consider that iron would be incapable of preserving soft dinosaur tissue if it could actually distribute it from the dinosaur's blood throughout all the tissue. Of course, Mary Schweitzer and her team totally submerged specimens to preserve them to obtain the results they desired. But the only way to accomplish this naturally is distributed by water. Well, guess what? That brings up another huge problem, as water also degrades soft tissue before iron can preserve it. In addition to this, soft tissue has also been found in bones, not directly associated with iron-rich blood, like in the bone horn of the Triceratops and bird feathers. More problems with iron preservation with microbiologist Kevin Anderson later in this video. The old earth idea was developed historically, not from letting the physical facts speak for themselves, but by imposing anti-biblical philosophical assumptions onto their geological observations, the idea driving the conclusion. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.